Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, we're taking a look at a movement aimed at rebranding death. We want to hear your thoughts, so tweet us or comment in our live YouTube chat, and you too can be in the stream. The finality of death is overwhelming for a lot of people. In fact, more than half of Americans are afraid or very afraid of facing it, according to a Chapman University study. But the birth of the death positive movement is hoping to change the cultural mindset. From coffin clubs to death cafes, people are learning ways to be comfortable with dying. The campaign is also the basis for a new HBO documentary, Alternate Endings, Six New Ways to Die in America. Take a look. It's my death. Don't tell me what I have to do. I want to go out with a quality of life. I want it to be on my terms. There are so many options. We provide urns and caskets for those alternative consumers that maybe don't want traditional burials. Funny, you know, people ask, why are you taking off work and, you know, going with my friend to pick out her burial plot? <laughs> He wanted the Memorial Space Flight. Two, one. It's okay to do something non-traditional to celebrate and to honor somebody's life. And here to talk about death positivity from Burlington, Vermont, Francesca Arnoldi. She's an end-of-life doula and author of Cultivating the Doula Heart, The Essentials of Compassionate Care. In Los Angeles, California, Elua Arthur. She's also an end-of-life doula and trainer. In Seattle, Washington, Michael Hebb. He's the founder of Death Over Dinner, an organization aimed at changing the way we talk about death. And in Hart, Michigan, Sarah Cruz. She's president of the National Home Funeral Alliance and founder of Heartland Prairie Cemetery, the first all-natural burial ground in Kansas. Welcome, everyone, to the stream. I want to start with the view from our audience, our community, because we asked them, why is this conversation so difficult to have? Acknowledging that it is a difficult conversation. And this is the answer from Mr. McAttack on Twitter, who says, it's because I like being alive. So yes, with that in mind, and I would agree, I would agree with uh, our, our viewer on Twitter here. I want to open this one up to the floor. When was the first time you were faced with your own mortality? Who wants to take that one on first? I'll start. Hey, Lua. The very first time I was faced with my mortality was when I was on a bus in Cuba with a woman who was 36 and had uterine cancer. And while it was really about the end of her life, it brought the end of my life into very sharp focus. I had had conversations about death theoretically, but it was the first time that I thought, I'm going to die. Everybody here is going to die. Why are we not talking about the fact that we're going to die? Why are we not living in relationship with the end of our lives consistently? And for me, that was the first time that my death, the end of my life, actually became very, very salient. But it had the power to bring me back into the present moment and to help me redefine the values upon which I wanted to live and the values upon which I wanted to carry out the rest of my life. Mm. Michael? Yeah, well, it, it actually was a pretty sad moment. Um, it was when I was in second grade. Um, and my father, um, who was um, much older than most fathers, um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, and that was the beginning of his decline. Um, what wasn't clear and what wasn't made clear to us as, um, as children was that he was going to die and it was coming um, soon. And the lack of conversation about death, the fact that it had this almost shameful, amorphous presence in our life, um, proved to be really detrimental um, to our family, to me personally, um, but also to our family structure. And it, um, my father's illness and his loss had a very negative impact on um, all of our family, the health, et cetera. And so I mean, it's one of the core reason and probably the core reason why I do this work mm -hmm. so people don't have to have that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sorry to hear about your loss there. Francesca, what about for you? I think for me, I experienced the loss of loved ones a little later in life. I lost a dear aunt when I was in my 20s, but it still wasn't about my mortality when she died. It was about my grief and my connection with her. It wasn't until I had my own children 
that I really started to think about the impact of my death on other people. And that was the impetus for me to start planning and preparing and trying to do what I can to organize my own life and end of life for them. And Sarah? My story is similar to Francesca's. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about death, but I had an experience of a beloved aunt dying when I was quite young, 12 years old. And, uh, you know, that ever since then, it's just been um, really taking a look. And when I had my own children, uh, that's when it really, my own mortality became uh, a little clearer and decided it was important to uh, pay attention. So I want to share this from Juliet on Twitter, who says, it is an inevitable part of life that we all have to deal with, sometimes very unexpectedly, but we don't discuss it. We use euphemisms to pussyfoot around talking about it. Even in the event of a peaceful, expected death, it is very isolating for survivors when others are simply unwilling, embarrassed, awkward in addressing the subject of the dead person, and feelings associated with loss, guilt, anger, grief, because they've never been encouraged to talk about it. Michael, why do you think it is that we're so afraid to talk about this subject and so awkward about it when we do talk about it? Well, I think there's lots of reasons. I have a lot of compassion for the difficulty that people have with this conversation. We're actually not designed um, as humans to face our mortality. We have uh, something called um, a, a number of different biases that keep us from thinking about death um, thinking about the fact that we're not going to be here. Um, Daniel Kahneman, um, the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, um, did incredible work around these biases that keep certain things out of our reach. I mean, the, the really sad um, fact about that is, I mean, there's so many, um, you know, effects, uh, negative effects of us not facing this conversation. Um, but one of the main ones is that if we don't know our loved one's wishes, if we don't have this conversation, we don't know how to honor them. And if we don't honor, know how to honor someone, um, we grieve longer. Um, and when we grieve longer, it has a huge impact on our life. It also um, leads to an incredible number of bankruptcies. So there's emotional loss, um, there's financial loss, um, there's a lot wrapped up in this one conversation. Mm -hmm. And of course, part of being wrapped up in that conversation is the different cultural experiences that we all bring to it. So I want to share two different tweets here. Um, the first is from Rama, and Elu, I'll direct these to you. Rama says, this is a fascinating topic. I'm generalizing to some extent here, but what happens post-death is not given much or serious thought in Kenya. Folks dying without wills, triggering long, drawn-out succession battles are rather common, and we're still stuck in the bury or cremate debate. So that's one person and writing from that experience. Another writes in, this is Dan Hausa, uh, a Nigerian, who says, death is inevitable. I don't fear death. I only fear what I will face after death as a Muslim. Elua, I bring these up to ask whether or not you think that this conversation in itself is one that is specific to the audience listening. Or do you think this is something that's universal and can be applied to people of different faith traditions, different backgrounds, different cultures? One of the most fascinating things about death is that it is entirely universal. Everybody is going to have to experience it at one point or another. So the conversation about death wellness is something that is applicable to every person on the planet. Different cultures deal with it differently, and so that creates some variance in our preparedness for it and our relationship to dying. Uh, in a lot of other cultures, there is still a sense of elderhood, and elders are revered, whereas in places like the United States, for instance, aging and it, youth has a premium upon it. And so in cultures where there is a stronger respect for elderhood and for the aging process, I find that there is a greater relationship to dying and a greater awareness of or, um, or coming together of the fact that life eventually means getting old and possibly definitely dying. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. cultural variances make a big difference, but the reality is it's it's applicable to every single one of us. Mm -hmm. The way that our culture has changed now also has a big impact in that we're dying not in community so much anymore. We go off to elder care facilities or we die in hospitals. There's not a bunch of people around. I'd like around. to add to that. Yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah. Absolutely. I want to uh, dovetail on that. Not only are we um, dying in um, medical settings for the most part, 
all those 75% of people in the U.S. say that they would like to die at home. We're also then outsourcing the care of dead to what has become a like $20 billion a year industry, rather than um, reclaiming that tradition of caring for our own at home and, and then having a natural burial afterwards. So that kind of, those sort of cultural traditions of taking care of our own, being familiar with the tasks associated with after-death care have completely gone away from this generational wisdom that had been passed down for millennia. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, mm -hmm. we find a, um, a counterpoint in the food industry. Um, we industrialized our food um, and our food is not as nutritious. Um, we turned, um, as a result, we turned death um, into a medicalized act, a medical act, where it's actually a community act. Um, it's it's what Sarah was discussing. Like, there's a reclaiming that is possible to us, but that actually requires literacy. Um, so to make empowered decisions about anything, we need literacy. And I think that's the work that all three of the panelists are doing in common, which is raising the literacy around this topic, um, reducing the taboo. Um, but I do want, if we have time, not just to talk about the dark and the dread, but actually the joy that is inherent in this conversation. I, of course we have time for that, and I think that is part of what this conversation is. But you raised so many important points there that I want to just pick apart them uh, so that we make sure we get all of them. One of the things you talked about is the fact that this has kind of been medicalized and, and turned into something that is not such an empathetic process anymore. So I wanted to share this from Kev, who says, practically, I have a will. I want to be buried in as low impact a way as possible, ideally under a tree, after every scrap of me that can be used to help someone else has been taken from me. My body is just a vehicle for my soul. Once I'm done with it, I don't much care. And Sarah, naturally I'm going to give this one to you because this is something at the heart of what you do. So when Michael was talking about the way, the coldness really, not, not to put words in your mouth, Michael, but the gist of it was, this has become such a cold process. You're trying to push away from that, Sarah. That's correct. So yeah, not only is the dying become a cold process, but the uh, burying ourselves has turned into a, in, immensely resource intensive the way that we do it in this country. We're burying um, just outrageous amounts of uh, steel and coffin, excuse me, and concrete and like rainforest har harvested hardwoods in the ground every year, not to mention all that embalming fluid. And what people don't realize is that none of that is necessary. You literally can be wrapped in a shroud that can be as simple as a quilt that your grandmother made and laid um, nature. One of the things nature does best is decompose, you know, <laughs> and it's just so simple. We've like overcomplicated not only um, dying, but after death care and and burial, mm -hmm. you know, you just use it. I'd like to. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add for Kev, I really acknowledge you for being so clear about what your wishes are and absolutely Sarah's point um, is very important in that those of us that have values in caring for our planet while we're living need to carry those through into our dying as well. One very, very key point, however, is to make sure that we are writing down our wishes. Our wishes need to be written down and it requires us to talk about it first so the people in our lives know what it is that we want written down so that after our death, the people in our lives aren't struggling to try and figure out what we would have wanted. So, Elua, I love this point. Well. I, I will admit I do not have a will. And I talk to my sisters about it often. And we're, we're morbid. And so we talk about the next time Thanksgiving rolls around and all the family is together, we want to sit down and make it a will writing session so that exactly Great. that happens. Show of hands in our panel, how many of you have a will? How many of you uh, have family members and friends who know your wishes? Aside from just a will, a will is like the, it's like the yeah. tip of the iceberg because that's just dealing with exactly. your possessions. Mm -hmm. What about your desires for life support? Mm. That causes so much more grief and heartache than what happens with your art. Granted, that is difficult as well. But people care about, they care about what, what you value. How long do you want to be kept on life support? What, right. Who it's should make decisions for you in the event that you can't? Sure. Mm -hmm. These things matter. Right. And, and I, I want to... Francesca, I, I see you trying to get in. We haven't heard from you yeah, in a minute. Go ahead, Francesca. I also feel like it's of service to your loved ones to develop your more personal wishes. So I myself have created a death journal. 
and my family knows where it is and that it exists and they've seen it in closed form. And within it, I have mementos, I have photos, I have, it's kind of a scrapbook of life, but it also have, has messages to my family. It has all of my wishes. It has the ways in which I hope that they take really good care of themselves during grieving. So in this way, it's a, it gives me peace of mind knowing that I'm doing as much as I can in advance and that I can still care for them in my absence. So they have everything that's planned out, everything that I've thought of, the music, the poems, the readings, what I see as being comfortable as an atmosphere for my dying and for my aftercare plans as well. Mm -hmm. Here's another mm -hmm. uh, group of people that are doing just that. A couple of tweets here from Good to Go. That's the organization. They write, I facilitate advanced planning parties where people, while young and healthy, uh, can get together. It's like a death cafe, but with homework. So with a rock and roll death soundtrack, cocktails and potluck dishes to share, we talk about death duties and go over the Good to Go departure files before an emergency. They go on to say that we gather together to talk about death, grief, dying, and death preparedness, and attendees leave with advanced planning documents. Uh, so this is one idea, but taking it even another step forward is someone who sent us a video comment about something called the dinner party. Uh, it's similar to what you do, Michael. So I'll play this from Carla Fernandez, and I'd love you to tell me what you think about it assume that 20 and 30 somethings just don't want to talk about grief and loss and life after. But for those of us who've actually lived it and are oftentimes the first people in our peer group to lose someone, we very much do want to talk about it, or some of us do. It's that we don't always have the people within our networks who we feel safe approaching to have that conversation. It's not really something you can bring up at the office water cooler or while you're out at a bar. So through the dinner party, um, we're helping to match people to one another based on their zip codes, based on what they like to do on the weekends, so that they can actually have a community of friends who get it and understand the highs and the lows of life after losing someone and help each other move forward together. So, Michael, that's one way. Tell us about death over dinner. Yeah, well, I love the work that Carla and Lennon have done with the dinner party. So, and I also want to acknowledge, um, even though we're giving people a lot of great ideas, it is very hard um, to get these things done. I spent seven years building Death Over Dinner. There's been over a million people who sat down and used our resources via deathoverdinner.org. Um, and I also wrote a book about how to have a conversation about death. And I did complete my will, and I used the five wishes um, to do this, until I had published the book. Um, so it, it takes, it, it, I have a, a great deal of compassion for people that haven't broached this topic. And one of the, the ways that it has been difficult for all of us is that people haven't made it attractive, haven't made graceful ways um, or exciting ways to have this conversation. Death over dinner is that. Um, it is, here's a beautiful way to have this conversation. Um, we give people the script, um, all of the resources for free online. Um, but I, and then people have a multi-hour, sometimes, sometimes an hour and a half um, meal where they talk about not just death, but really how they want to live. Mm. Um, and, and I want to give, we've been talking a bit about the, the stick. I want to give people the carrot here. Um, the joy that's attached to this conversation. Um, we know that facing our mortality um, actually um, makes us funnier. Um, these are <laughs> studies that have been done. Um, it improves our sense of humor. And there's been early work done by Dr. Jordana Jacobs about how it actually increases our capacity to love. Um, and our ability to connect with our, our life partner. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we get laughter and love and human connection out of this conversation. Those are what the things we need for longevity. Those are the things we want in life. Um, so it's not just coal that we're selling here. I love that you and said I that. Wanted... This is a tweet we got from Kamsi who says, embracing death can assist us in living a happier life. It can make us savor every day we spend alive. It is hard, but anyone who can should accept death as a certain end. So those who have accepted that fact, I, I, I want to push on just a little bit to introduce another idea. This from Dr. Anetta Malin. She's the person who gave us the idea for this show in the first place. She pitched this topic because she wanted us to look into end-of-life doulas. Now, she sent us a video comment about what that is. And Francesca, I'll direct this one to you. Have a listen. What do end-of-life doulas do? We work with people often from the time of a life-limiting or terminal diagnosis all the way through to active dying and death. And sometimes we even help out with the funerals. 
and grief support afterwards if you're a death doula like me. We're client focused, client centered and client led. We're here to support, help you form compassionate communities, laugh with you, listen to you, um, answer your questions honestly and openly. We're here for you. Let's talk. Francesca? Hi, that's beautiful. I really appreciate her description. Yeah, we are non-medical emotional support people and the demand that we've seen for our training course has been astounding. It's remarkable how many people are stepping up into this work and are interested in it. We've had over 500 people complete it. It's online. We're getting people from all over the world. But we're not only getting private practice doulas. We're getting doctors, nurses, nurses' aides, spiritual care providers, mental health workers, hospice volunteers. People are eager for this information. How do I offer compassionate support? How can I come in with a non-judgmental approach? How can I sit with people in silence? It's, it's really beautiful, and it gives back to me so much more than I can explain. <laughs> hey, Lua, you are Another also a death doula. I see you trying to jump in there, but I'm so curious. Are there many people of color doing the work that you do? There are not yet. Uh, I find that often when I walk into rooms of practitioners, they're generally uh, probably in the 50-ish age range and older white women. Uh, not only do we not have a lot of people of color, we also don't have a lot of men, and we also don't have people that uh, that assign any that outside the gender uh, conformities. So what I'm finding, particularly with my work, is that I've created opportunities for people to have representation and feel as though there's somebody who understands what their background is and uh, particularly what is important to them. In my training course, also where I train death doulas, I'm finding that. I'm, I have a lot of people of color that are signing up for this course, a lot of people that identify as queer or other somehow. And it's really important since all of us at some point are going to die. It's very nice to know that the person that's sitting across from you might understand your experience. And we can learn not only the emotional, spiritual, and practical components of caring for dying, but also honor the individual as a complete individual as a complete individual, looking at all elements. I wanted yes. to bring this up here in, in the closing minutes of our conversation. And Sarah, I see you trying to get in there, so I'll direct it to you. Victoria says she wants people to know it's OK to say they're dead out loud. Acknowledgement and ownership of our yes. mortality can only lead to being more relaxed talking about death. Would you agree with her? I absolutely agree with her, you know, starting to use, uh, rather than using euphemisms, to use the actual words, you know, even when we're talking with children about death. But I wanted to add to what the death doulas were, were saying mm -hmm. about um, being there, you know, present, go on down the continuum of care. Um, the after death work, becoming familiar with these after death tasks, caring for our own ones, loved ones at home, um, being physically and personally involved in the burial of our own dead um, allows us to grieve a little more healthily, perhaps. And we've relegated ourselves as spectators um, after death, you know, where we stand there and have it done for us. And so a lot of my work is about choice, people understanding that they can do this legally. You can keep a body at home. You can take care of it there. You, can, um, you need to maybe connect with a home funeral guide who knows the laws in your state. But in virtually every state, you can do this and find out if you've got a, um, a green burial ground nearby. And so check out the homefuneralalliance.org to find um, home funeral guides that are familiar with uh, state laws. And um, and I'm glad Green you burial counts. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Brought oh it God. up, Sarah, be because what what the user is getting is a laundry list of some great ideas and great practitioners. Um, and what we're still lacking are um, resources that meet somebody when they're in the middle of a crisis mm -hmm. or grieving. Doulas do this one on one yeah. as practitioners. Absolutely. But we've and I wish it was like a month from now we're having this conversation because we're about to launch this platform for the best practitioners Ooh, all around I, the country. I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, I have to pause you there. Someone take yeah, that idea and run with it. That's all the time we have for now, but thank you to Francesca, Elua, Michael, and Sarah for being part of this conversation. And a big thank you to our community member who pitched this show. Until next time, see you online.